It's This Just Works Lunch Break with marketing hacks, actionable insights, special guests, and more. Featuring international best-selling author Jonah Berger with musical guest Anna Pancaldi. I'm your band leader, Julian Villar, and here's your host, Jason Miller. Welcome, welcome to the program. Uh, so happy everyone could join us today. Uh, this is something really, really new and unique. I'm really excited. Uh, I will tell you, we are 100% live, so anything can happen. Uh, anything will happen. Something probably will go wrong. Um, but there's a lot of people behind the scenes working to pull this off. We try to make this uh, as fun as possible. So bear with us. We're going to have some fun today. Uh, and I do want to introduce you to um, our band leader and uh, my co-host today, Mr. Julian Villard. Julian, how you doing, buddy? Jason, it is so fun to be here. I am coming to you from a basement in St. Louis, Missouri, ready to accompany you into the world of uh, online marketing. Did I do that right? <laughs> Uh, it's called market. I think it's been called marketing without a net. Doug Kessler uh, coined that term, I believe. Anyway, uh, I tell you what, it's still locked down in London, uh, and my uh, my hair has, has never been this long. It hasn't been this long since 1992, when I was in a hair metal band called Silent Cry. We were huge in certain zip codes, six three three zero three, I believe, was one of them. St. Louis, my hometown. Julian, uh, how's how, are, 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 lockdown? Isn't really. Uh, how are you doing with, with lockdown? Uh, what is lockdown? We're just over here in America doing our thing. No, um, I am in a basically not leaving the house. I live in a 63130, uh, which was a big uh, zip code for Silent Cry. Big zip code. You guys still have some posters around. I've seen them. Um, yeah, legendary. And then just overnight, uh, Nirvana just wiped out the uh, the entire genre. It was it was it uh, was it was it was nasty. Like uh, Warrant Poison. Slaughter all gone uh, overnight. So um, we're going to jump in here. Julian, you ready to do this thing? Let's kick off, man. We got uh, we got a hell of a show lined up here. And uh, yeah, we're ready to go. We are ready, Jason. I think we should start them the way all good uh, lunch hour break, late night shows start. And that is with a monologue. Thank you for that warm intro. Uh, and again, thanks everyone for joining us today. It is so good to be back at work after the winter break. Although I didn't realize until I talked to my boss this morning that we don't get two weeks off for Valentine's Day. New guy. I, <laughs> I love Valentine's Day though, one of my favorite holidays. And this year my wife gave me one of the most romantic gifts ever, snowshoes. Now, she knows, she knows my love language, exercise equipment, and I know hers sarcasm. Uh, when I unwrapped the present, I was like, wow, my bride really wants to spend some quality time with me. Uh, until I realized uh, there was only one set of snowshoes. I get it, hon. Okay, okay, I get it, hon. <laughs> I get it, hon. You need some quality me time to re-binge Tiger King. Uh, but here's what makes this gift so tender and intimate like these aren't just any snowshoes no sir this pair is from those geniuses all uh, over at all in one marketing i like to call them aom for short uh but all in aom's algorithm actually anticipates needs you don't even have it shoves features in that you don't even want solutions that are not only unprecedented but unnecessary solutions that are not only counterproductive but counterintuitive Right? So how do they pull off this marvel of marketing magic, you ask? Well, AOM gets to know you, the customer, as a unique individual. Then they strip away all the personality characteristics that bring you joy and jam you into one of three personas. At all-in-one customer, as an all-in-one customer, you're not just a number, you're a nondescript icon. It's like they've known me all my life, Julian. Jason, I, it's this is amazing. Yes, keep going. So, Julian, I tell you, this enables them to design customized solution that fits you like an albatross. <laughs> but you know, Julian, everyone, 
I frankly, I love this trend of piling on. Like last week I was at my checkup at my dermatologist and she says to me, as of last Tuesday, I'm also a neurosurgeon. So why don't we crack open your noggin and take a peek right after I fix this armpit acne? Oh, joyous day. I mean, I walked in here to get the only pro I walked in here to get the only problem I had fixed. I left with a cornucopia of life-threatening health risks to lose sleep over. Uh, and I get all this done for the price of one ten dollars copay, and I don't even have to make an extra trip to the hospital. <laughs> so uh, apologies. Uh, I've let my exuberance carry me away from the task at hand here. So uh, let me tell you how this all worked out. This marketing miracle worked out for me and my snowshoes, right? So all in one marketing knows that when I'm out snowshoeing, that there's a high probability that I'll be cold. <laughs> how, how on earth do they know this? Anticipating that I'll be thirsty for some warm refreshment, they bundle on a coffee maker without my consent. <laughs> Diving deeper into my psychographic profile, they beat me to the punch asking for some creamer, <laughs> which inspires me to pick up my pace because I'm lactose intolerant. Thank you, A. Um, oh, thanks for the frother. <laughs> Their regression model goes on to forecast that I'm likely to travel with a pack of friends since I have a completely rational fear of being attacked by a snow sasquatch. So, Bam, service for six, all Bluetooth enabled. So thanks to the, uh, the wonders, <laughs> thanks to the wonders of statistical profiling, they know I'm a little bit clumsy and there's a 73% chance that I'll splatter coffee on my pants, which is why I'll want to leverage this very stylish rain poncho that they've tucked into the sleeve underneath the left shoe. <laughs> They're not about to let me show up for my eight o'clock meeting with a stained ascot. Absolutely, absolutely not. So now, it is true that physically there's no room remaining on my feet, uh, but with all this functionality, who the heck wants to go snowshoeing anyway? I'm gonna sit in my garage and savor a cup of espresso. And thanks to AOM, I'll have more time to relax because they eliminated my entire customer journey and assigned me to a de the same destination as everyone else. It's like telling my travel agent, hey, this summer, we'd like to take our kids to Ireland to learn their heritage and meet their cousins. And she says back to me, nope, you're going to El Segundo. <laughs> then she hands me a brochure for an all-inclusive resort where the only meal plan is a seafood buffet. And the fact that I have a severe allergy to shellfish is offset by the fact that I can eat as much as I want for free. So I get my fill of popcorn shrimp while my head swells up to the size of my kid's hopper ball. <laughs> and as I drift off into anaphylactic shock, the ambulance rushes me to see my allergist, who, as of this week, is also my dermatologist slash neurosurgeon. So uh, there you have it, folks, all in one marketing. It's a myth. It's not one size fit all. We all know that. Uh, we got a great, great show for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a fantastic show lined up for you today. Jonah Berger is here. Jonah Berger. Jonah Berger. Uh, Anna Pancaldi is here, uh, one of my favorite singer-songwriters. She can perform a few songs. Uh, Julian, what else do we have in store for these fine folks? Well, we have all these incredible uh, marketing hacks, so let's uh, get going with one right now. This is the first one. is coming from Andy Crestodino, right? Uh... Hey there, Active Campaign fans. This is Andy Crestodino from Orbit Media. Happy Active Campaign users, longtime customers, big fans. Super quick marketing hack. The one thing that can make the biggest difference with the smallest effort that I know of is to make the sender name on your emails a person. If you're sending email from a company, you can expect lower <laughs> click-through rates, lower open rates, and a higher unsubscribe rate because honestly, it's very easy to unsubscribe from an email or delete an email from a company. It's a faceless brand. Who cares? But if the sender name is a person, maybe the person plus the company, Andy from Orbit Media, in my experience, talking to clients and having given this advice for a long time, you can see a 20% lift in open rates from that one change. A one-time, zero-cost, 10-second change can give you a 20% lift in open rates. That's my kind of marketing hack. 
Again, Andy from Orbit, I hope this is helpful. See you later. Thank you, Andy Crestina, one of the smartest marketers that I know. Uh, we got one more marketing hack coming up. Uh, over to you, Julian. All right, this next marketing hack comes from the one and only Miss Valerie Cray. My name is Valerie Craig, and I'm the creative director at Active Campaign. For today's marketing hack, I would like to talk about design. If you're staring down a marketing or communication design problem and you're not sure where to start, let me guarantee you that somewhere out there in the world, a designer has already thought about this problem and solved it for you. The key here is finding great resources for your design needs. Design is an important differentiator for brands today. So first up, photography. If you're seeking beautiful, free photography that you can download and use in any project, check out Unsplash. For gorgeous photos of black and brown people, go to Nappy. Next up, symbols and icons. The Noun Project is an excellent resource, very easy to use. I recommend picking one style of icon and using that for the duration of your project. For all of your color needs, go to Coolers. Coolers think cool meets color. Here you can create the perfect palette or find in inspiring color schemes uh, that already exist that you can use for your project. And don't forget templates and layouts. Creative Market, while not a free resource, is an excellent resource as they have hundreds of thousands of templates to use whether you're designing a business card, an infographic, or a website. Also, layout tools. Canva is a great one, especially for non-designers. Here, you can create all sorts of different design layouts, whether it's for social media, a book layout, presentation, or many, many more. Lastly, I'd like to recommend Active Campaign. Here we have over 125 expertly crafted email templates ready for you to use right now. Whether you're doing email marketing or marketing automation, our design team recently worked to create over 70 new designs that we uploaded to our platform with you in mind. So please check them out. Thanks so much. Ah, thank you, Valerie. Welcome back, everyone. Um, just getting ready. Uh, I know Jonah Berger is backstage in our green room. Uh, we're going to bring him out in just a second. Um, Julian, uh, you want to? Uh, you, I want to just say a big shout out really quick um, to Contagious, one of my favorite books, and uh, Jonah's latest book, uh, The Catalyst. So uh, both of these books are should be on every marketer's bookshelves. Jonah or uh, Julian, over to you. It's all right. There's too many J's. Jason, Jonah, Julian. We're all J's. Just you can just call me J. I'll pretty much respond to whatever you want. I thought that marketing hack was amazing. I like the coolers thing. I'm going to use that. Okay, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Our guest, the main man of the hour, Mr. Jonah Berger. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Jonah Berger. Uh, Berger, you've spent decades studying uh, uh, what makes things popular, how ideas spread. Uh, you're a professor of marketing at Wharton School of University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of Contagious. This is the book that changed the way I think about content and marketing. Welcome to the program, Jonah Berger. How you doing, my friend? Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm glad you can make it today. Uh, I do. I, I know we have a short time today, so I want to make the most of it. I want to jump right into some questions. Uh, the biggest question I have for you, I, I want to get to the catalyst in a second here, but Contagious, um, the landmark book talks about the power of word of mouth and uh, uh, has some remarkable stories and examples there. Uh, one point that stands out to, still to me to this day is, is that uh, you, you found that only 7% of word of mouth happens online. And I'm wondering, how do you see that uh, sort of adapting or changing uh, with the pandemic? And, and how does that play out into today? I think there are two pieces there that are, that are important. First of all, pandemic or not, it's been changing over time. Uh, the amount of word of mouth online has slowly been increasing. Let's be careful. It's not increasing as much as you might think. Uh, it's not that all word of mouth is online or even most word of mouth uh, is online at the moment, but, but it is going up. Uh, and then second, in terms of COVID, certainly more people are, are talking online than, than had previously. It'd be interesting to see what happens uh, once COVID is over. Obviously, when we're back in the offices and going to restaurants and uh, getting together with friends, more word of mouth will be happening offline. But notice that it's not just face-to-face -face versus, say, social media, for example. 
the phone is offline, uh, even though it's not face-to-face. -face. Uh, and so you are seeing a lot of switching uh, in COVID from face-to-face -face interactions, things that would happen uh, right next to someone else to moving over the phone. Excellent, thank you. And, and what do you what do you think the biggest lessons from contagion are uh, in this in coming out of this pandemic, right? In the post pandemic world, uh, what do you think is the the best lessons, the biggest lessons that we can apply as marketers, as entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, uh, SMB specifically? Uh, what are those? What does that look like to you? You know, I think uh, it's a tough time at the moment, right? Lots of businesses are struggling, uh, lots of individuals are struggling, um, uh, but eventually we're gonna come out of this. Um, and what can we learn from this and how can we move forward? I think it's a big opportunity. Um, uh, lots of companies, lots of individuals have been forced to change. Uh, whether it's not going into the office, whether it's ordering things online, whether it's uh, not going to the gym and doing something else instead. People never like to change, uh, but they've been forced to change. And so they're more open to change uh, as a result. And so for all those small, uh, medium business owners out there, solopreneurs, uh, other folks you mentioned, I think now is a real big opportunity to get folks to switch. How can you leverage the power of word of mouth? Uh, people trust peers much more than they trust uh, advertisements or brands. How can you leverage the power of word of mouth and use that to get your stuff to catch on? Uh, and now is a great time to do that because people are more open-minded to change than they would usually be. It seems to me that uh, just from my own experience that uh, customer experience seems to be everything and, and people are open to switching brands more frequently. Are you, are you finding that as well? What, what, is the, what, is, what does it take to, to win somebody over from a, from a competitive brand these days in your opinion? You know, uh, it takes uh, something, but it doesn't take as much as we might think. I think uh, a lot of times we focus uh, on the upsides, why our product or service or idea is better than someone else's. I think a better thing to do, well, that is important, a better thing to do is think about our customers or clients or audience. What are the barriers that are getting in their way? What are the problems that they're trying to solve? And how by removing those barriers can we make change more, more likely? Um, and I think that that's really the key. Yes, it's about what we're offering, but it's also about understanding our, our audience, whoever they might be. Really, I, you know, I love the story from the book where you test a couple of slogans uh, on, a, on a campus trying to get students to eat more fruits and vegetables. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could talk about the results of that a little bit, how it applies to marketers. And, and furthermore, um, how does a brand, you know, find that moment and that trigger? You talk about habitats too. I know there's a lot in this question, a lot to unpack here, but uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So we did a study at, at Stanford University a number of years ago. We we're trying to get undergraduates, undergraduate students, to eat more fruits and vegetables. They say they want to eat more fruits and vegetables. They mean to eat more fruits and vegetables, but they're not doing it. And so we see if we can use a slogan to change their behavior. And we split the group of students into two groups, sort of A-B test. One gets a slogan uh, that sounds really good, uh, that everyone likes. Another group gets a slogan that doesn't perform uh, as well. People are less likely to say they, they like that slogan. But then we don't just look whether they like the slogan or not. We look at whether it actually changes behavior. And what we find is quite interesting. The slogan that people liked, they thought would be really effective, didn't change behavior, but the slogan that they didn't like as much and didn't think would work actually had a much bigger impact and a positive impact on behavior. And so why might that be? And I think as marketers, we often do things like slogan testing, like advertising testing. We ask people how much they like something and guess how likely they would be to react to something in a positive manner. And we think a lot about whether people like something. We think a lot less though about whether people will remember that thing and whether they will remember it at the right time. And that's really what triggers, and I talk much more about this in a whole chapter in Contagious, that's really what triggers are all about. It's not about changing how much we like something, it's about changing whether we're thinking about that thing. Because if we're thinking about something, we're much more likely to do it. There was a great study that was done in the grocery store a number of years ago where they changed the music that played over the PA system. Imagine you're wheeling your grocery cart through the aisle, some days they play French music, some days they play German music, what do they find? Well, on days they play French music, sales of French wine go up, and on days they play German music, sales of German wine and beer go up. Did the music change what wine people like? No, they still like what they like. What it did is it reminded them to purchase it. And that's just one example of triggers, but over 70% of purchase is consideration. Are you thinking about it at the right time? And so the key insight here is it's not enough to have people like you, they have to be thinking about you. Think about how you can use things in the environment to remind people of you, so be top of mind more often and tip of tongue more as well. 
So, so that, that brings into the, the habitat that you mentioned, correct? Like the habitat. Uh, and and how, what's the best way to figure out what your, what your habitat is? How do you start to explore um, where that habitat is for? I mean, it, I guess it would be a little bit more difficult if it's not a physical product um, and, and maybe in the SaaS world. How do you find that habitat? Where do you start? I mean, I think you start with your customer, right? Who do you want to be triggered? Well, uh, when do you want them to think about you? What is in the environment at that time? And how can you make a link to that thing? So there's four questions. The, the who, the when, the what, and the how will help you already probably hopefully know who that audience is, that key target segment. But then when do you want to make sure to come to mind? What is in their environment and how create a link? And sort of thinking through that process um, will help you get to the right trigger and leverage the right habitat. Jonah, um, regarding storytelling, I know that uh, we've been talking about storytelling for years as marketers, and I, I guess everyone claims to be a storyteller these days, but do you think that we're overcomplicating storytelling? Do you think that, uh, that we, we maybe uh, threw around this word a little bit too loosely and then actually figured out how difficult it is to tell a story uh, to even bring in that habitat and then trigger that reaction? You know, it's an interesting question. I think uh, many brands, organizations, individuals have trouble with storytelling, uh, but I don't think the troubles with stories themselves. We're all great storytellers. We tell great stories all the time about things we did this weekend or funny things we saw or funny things that happened. We're good storytellers. The problem is when we try to tell stories for brands and organizations, we somehow put a completely different hat on, right? Now we're no longer just telling stories. We're thinking about how to effectively use stories to do something. And that's something I think we're a little bit less good at. Um, and part of the reason we're a little bit less good at it is we don't really understand why stories work. We understand that they're effective, but we don't understand well, what makes a better story. Uh, we don't understand how we make sure to carry our brand, our message, or idea along for the ride in a story. Um, and so the key idea there, I think, is to understand the science of stories, both why they work and when they work, um, as well as how to embed themselves, ourselves uh, in them. There's a chapter in Contagious all about storytelling. Other authors have also written about storytelling quite well. But I think just the notion that um, we can be great storytellers for organizations by chance isn't going to happen. We need to think of ourselves as engineers. Let's be better at engineering stories, uh, understanding why they work, and, and using their tools more effectively. Jonah, thank you. Who, who, do, who do you think is, uh, who do you look to for inspiration for telling stories, or who do you think is doing a, a remarkable job of it uh, right now? Uh, you know, I don't know that I have uh, one brand in particular that does uh, my favorite job of telling stories. Uh, I, I use an example of a company called Dave's Killer Bread in my class, which, um, uh, you know, MBA students wouldn't think bread would be a very remarkable product. Uh, but lots of people talk about the brand. Why is it called Dave Killer Bread? Because they um, are willing to, uh, I think he actually had a run-in with the law uh, a number of years ago, but they're willing to hire um, uh, folks that have been to prison uh, as members of their team um, and giving them a second chance. And it really has a great story story because that brand has an underlying uh, message. They have an underlying set of values that drive what they do. Um, I think that's easy for them because they have that. I think sometimes that's harder for brands to find. It doesn't mean you can't find a great story. You just have to understand how to find it and, and shape, shape it. I actually know Dave's Killer Bread. Uh, the true story, I um, was living in San Francisco, was in the store looking uh, through for bread or whatever, and I looked down and I see this sort of heavy metal, like biker guy, and it's like completely calling out to me as this rock and roll persona. I picked it up, uh, I had it, it's fantastic, and I was raving about it the next day. So uh, it called to me from the shelf, Dave's Killer Bread. <laughs> um, J Jonah, this next one, this next question I have for you, uh, I, 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 I'm really interested in your in your point of view on this because uh, I wonder what's your take on this trend of of sort of uh, you know trying to manipulate and hack algorithms for engagement. Uh, and I see this. We see people like, oh, here's the big hack for the LinkedIn algorithm, or here's how to get more views, or and it's like, are we trying to hack our way to engagement instead of just uh, just <laughs> slowing down and uh, doing the right thing? Sure, yeah, and I'm happy to answer uh, one or two more questions and um, uh, then uh, uh, let you guys carry on with the rest of the show. Um, you know, I think if our goal is to go viral, that's the wrong goal. Uh, and, and what do I mean by that? Um, viral is often a flash in the pan. It's often here today, gone tomorrow. It often gets a lot of attention for a moment and then it disappears. Uh, and it doesn't mean understanding the science of why things go viral isn't important. It is. But I think our goal is really each one reach one. Right, which is everything we do as a brand or an organization, how can we reach just one more person with it? And how can we make sure that if someone has an experience with us, they tell 
just one more uh, other other person, right? Um, that can be from our marketing campaigns and a funny video we make. It can also be for customer service calls. It can also be for retail experiences. It can be everything we do uh, is a touch point for, for an organization. I'll, I'll give you an example. There's a, a brand you guys may be familiar with called Warby Parker. They make eyeglasses. Uh, one of the co-founders is nice enough to come speak in my class every year. And one thing he talks about uh, is how they started doing customer service uh, through Twitter, but they had a problem because there weren't enough uh, characters to really write a big response. So they started shooting videos. As you ask a question to them on Twitter, they shoot a quick video, post it up to YouTube, and share you the link um, uh, on Twitter. Now, those things aren't going viral. They're not getting millions of views. They're getting between 60 and 100 views. And you say, well, that's nothing. But then if you step back and think about it for a moment, well, hold on. I'm a customer. I'm only going to view this once. So it's getting 60 or 100 views. I must be sharing it with some other people, and those other people must be watching it as well. And so this act that was just expected to have impact one person is now impacting multiply more people than that. Now, one of those things isn't enough to get a lot of attention, but take that across everything we do. Think about that mindset across everything we do. It's going to have a really big impact. And so thinking more about each one reach one rather than viral, I think helps us get closer to our goals. Wonderful. Uh, I'm going to try to get two more quick ones in for you, but uh, I want to touch on the catalyst really quick. Uh, and then I uh, wanted to touch on some research if you can briefly. But uh, why, what, why did you write The Catalyst? What was the reason behind that? And, and what's your favorite story from that uh, book that showcases this type of thinking? Yeah, I mean, I wrote it because I was working with a lot of clients and organizations uh, that were trying to do something and weren't uh, getting the returns they hoped. They were hoping to change the customer's mind, the client's mind. They were trying to change the way their entire industry did business. Leaders were trying to transform their companies, and they were having a lot of problems. Uh, pushing wasn't working. Um, and so I started to realize, well, maybe there's a different approach. Right? Often we try to push and pressure and cajole and add more reasons and facts and figures. Uh, and when we push people, they don't usually go along. They often push back, often dig in their heels and are less willing to, to move. And so it turns out to much better approach is actually to identify the obstacles to change and, and mitigate them. Uh, basically removing barriers. If you look at great catalysts, great change agents, they don't say, well, what could I do to get someone to change? They instead ask a subtly different question. Why hasn't that person changed already? What's stopping them? And, and that's really what the book is all about. How do we identify those barriers that get in the way of change and how by identifying them and mitigating them can we make change more likely? Excellent. And one more quick question for you. This ca I caught this on Twitter just the other day. You shared some music, some research about music I thought was fascinating about how uh, song titles with different words actually outperformed or why these songs are, are so legendary. You, you have some insights here, right? Yeah, so much of the research I'm doing on the moment is about natural language processing. And I, essentially, how can we extract behavioral insight from textual data? How can we understand why songs succeed based on the lyrics, why movies succeed based on the scripts, uh, why customer service calls go better or worse based on the language and the paralanguage that customer service agents use, how online content, uh, certain ways of writing lead to longer reads uh, or not. And in this particular paper, really simple idea, we looked at thousands of songs over multiple years and how well they did on the billboard chart. And we found that songs that mention the word you more often are actually more successful. Um, so think about Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You or Queen's We Will Rock You. Uh, and part of the reason these type of songs are more effective is they encourage us to think about someone else in our own life that we feel that way toward. And so even something like one word, the word you, uh, can actually make us more successful in a, a variety of different areas. Jonah Berger, thank you uh, so much for the time. Uh, brilliant insights. Uh, contagious. Should, you should already have this one, folks, but go get the catalyst. You'll love it. Jonah, <laughs> thanks so much, my friend. Enjoy your day. Thanks so much for having me. Cheers. All right, Jonah Berger. Uh, you know what? Uh, I think we have a couple more segments. We do. Uh, we are open to questions. I don't know if you have a question for myself or for uh, for Julian. But uh, Julian, do we have? Can, can we have time to play uh, a little word sneak? Jason, we have however much time you tell me we have. See, this is this is why they make. This is why they pay me the big bucks. I'm an incredible enabler. So yeah, we could do. We could word sneak it out if you want to get that in there. Let's so this this is a, we're gonna do a little a, <laughs> a little trial a little trial this I don't even know if this is gonna work 
Um, this came up, uh, Lauren Alexander on the team, on the brand team, came up with this idea. Uh, she threw some words at Julian and myself. If you're not familiar with the game, uh, you basically, <laughs> it's a, uh, we have five random words. You might have seen this on Jimmy Fallon. He does a brilliant example. We borrowed it from him. Uh, we have five random words, and our goal is to work these words into the conversation as casually and seamlessly as possible. Uh, Julian, we have a pretty good rapport going. Um, I think you should go first. Uh, let's drop. Let's, let's get the first word up on the screen and uh, let's cruise through these. Let's try to do this in less than four minutes. So the idea is, I'm going to say this word. I'm trying to get you to say this word. You're trying. You just need to work this into the conversation. Oh well, this is a layup, bro. I am so excited for when the pandemic ends because the first thing I'm doing is going to an Iron Maiden show. That's the first thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I could dig that. I love Iron Maiden. I'm a huge fan. In fact, there's some really big news coming up uh, about our <laughs> about our April 22nd event, which I hope you're registered for, that has something to do with Iron Maiden. Let me just tell you that. Maybe you can guess. I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to say anything further, but I will tell you what. Uh, when I go downstairs, when I'm done with this, I'm going to get some yogurt, and I'm going to pull out a dolp, and I'm going to slap it right on the plate and, uh, and celebrate the success of this show. Oh, my Lord. You know, and rightfully so, Jason, because I think the broadcast has been so incredible because not only are we, like, giving people all this amazing content and interviews and upcoming musical guests, but they're really getting an insight into how customer experience automation works in, in real time. So, I mean, what an what a incredible piece of a gift you have given to the community here. Someone called this uh, edutainment, which I don't know where that word came from. But I will tell you, I'm not a huge, huge, huge fan of it. Uh, not, not. I don't like that word nearly as much as I love a, a good box of Junior Mints uh, out of the high school vending machine. That was sort of after lunch every day. Uh, you finish the lunch, go to the vending machine, Junior Mints. That's 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 my that's my whole high school. <laughs> oh my God! You know what? Because I totally had Junior Mints too in high school. It was amazing. Like basically. I would leave biology class, right? We would like, and I remember very clearly, I have this extremely clear thing in my mind. I'm in biology class and we're explaining exactly what a platypus is, right? Telling me all about it. I leave class, boom, hit some junior mints, straight in the mouth. Like the feeling of like learning about what a platypus is followed by the taste of a junior mint. It's like, it's honestly distinctly in my memory. It's like, you know, it's like when you smell a smell you haven't smelled for, for 20 years and you're, it brings you right back. You know what I'm talking about, Jason? I got to tell you, uh, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming. And, and you know what the problem with me is, is I'm, I'm looking at you on the screen when I should be looking into the camera like a real pro late night host, which I'm okay. clearly no, you're doing, you're not. You're but, professional. Uh, but there, I mean, there's got to be some kind of training for this, right? I mean, we, we, like, you know, I, 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 why am I going back to uh, grade school on this one? Like, you know, like you learn how to uh, 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 square dance and you have to learn how to do the do si -do. There has to be some yeah. sort of training uh, for late night oh, totally. <laughs> TV totally. shows. Uh, yeah, I would guess so. Am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, no, I don't think you're wrong at all. I think it's, um, it's important that, you know, and obviously someone who is a professional performer uh, who will kill plenty of time until the lower third appears to show him the next word that he's supposed to incorporate into the conversation. Not that I'm giving that cue to the people who are running this backstage. You know, the way I like to look at it is it's like, it's like, okay, you're a Venus flytrap, right? Your mouth is open and you're just waiting, sitting there all of the entire history of evolution for a fly to land your mouth. And you as the Venus flytrap just sort of, as soon as that moment comes, you jump on it. And this is your moment. You are a Venus flytrap right now, Jason. And this live stream is the moment when you're going to, all the years of practice and evolution that have come to bring you here, you're, you're capturing the fly, right? You feel me on that? At, at no point in my career did I say, uh, you know, I never really had a cornucopia of options for my career. But at no point did I say, man, I can't wait to become a B2B marketer. Come on, that was good. That well, was good. Top that one, it, Julian. It, that, that's, that was incredible. You're going to, I'm going to give you applause for that. But... Let me tell you, I mean, I get it. You know, it's like not all of us are born where just, you know, all of the doors are sort of smeared out before us. Wait, can I use smear in a, like as a, as, a, as a verb or do I have to say actual like smear? It's, it's like someone took all of the things that, that I wanted in my life and they just created a smear of a, a smear. 
they just created a, a schmear of possibilities and from which I chose. And, you know, here I am on a corporate live stream with you talking about B2B marketing. I, I mean, look, I think we both deserve a round of applause for that. Uh, I don't know why I'm, I'm laughing uh, more than, than you are. Uh, and, and I don't even know what to say about this one because uh, the, the team picked these words for me. Uh, I'm not prepared. Uh, the on, the this, only way this could go is back to the 70s uh, when we had these gas guzzling cars and my brother, uh, older brother, would drive around uh, with, he, we literally took my, this is a true story, we took my father's uh, Fender guitar cabinet and put it in the back of back seat of the car and wired the stereo to it. So it was like an 810 cab blasting Guns N' Roses. Uh, and I, I swear, I lost a quarter of my hearing that year, but I'll never forget his, uh, his, his red, Cutlass Sierra. Man, I, <laughs> I remember those cars. They were no so, good. No good. Uh, no, yeah. that was great. I mean, are you kidding me? No, I think uh, that the, build up, the, the build up and then was an incredible. Have, have we? I'm. I don't really know God, what else to that, say. That, I hope I, that's the last one. I hope that's the last word for this game. You know what? It is the last word, and I think let's move on to <laughs> our our musical guest that is coming in to serenade you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the one, the only, Anna Pancaldi. Jonah Berger. We're alive. These armies of a shaking, heavy hearted, you're mistaken. I will live without him. Cause everybody tired, everybody busy. Only got I knew stop and stare. And everybody tired, everybody busy. You know, they're forgetting. They're forgetting, so run away, run away, run away. I said, run away like the rest. And follow, run away, fall away. For there has been so much loss. We don't need this, we don't need this, we don't need this now. So run away, run away, run away. Passes by, gaze a while, and then fall to one side. They have a choice. These armies of a shaking, heavy hearts, a show mistake, and we live without him. Cause everybody tired, everybody busy, only got I knew stop and stare, and everybody tired. Everybody busy, you know, they're forgetting, they're forgetting. So run away, run away, run away. I said run away like the rest. And find a way, find a way, find a way. For there has been so much loss. We don't need this, we don't need this, we don't need this now. So run away, run away, run away. We bear to a bones that the sin our past is skin. We bear to a bones but the sin our past is skin. Everybody tired, everybody busy. Only gets I knew stop and stay when everybody tired, everybody busy. You know they're forgetting. So run away, run away, run away. I said run away like the rest. And fall away, fall away, fall away. For there has been so much loss. We don't need this. We don't need this. We don't need this now. So run
Matt Pancaldi, ladies and gentlemen. Wow, that was uh, gives me chills every time I hear that song. Anna, welcome to the program. Thank you for that. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, uh, you know, that song in particular, uh, as a quick story, you've heard this before, but uh, I was at a Hoover Phonic concert. Uh, you were opening for Hoover Phonic, and I was like in the back, like hanging like the cool guy at the bar. I'm like, oh, acoustic singer, songwriter, oh, I'll be back here. And you played that song, and I just, I, I remember turning around going, oh my God, there's like three choruses in that song. Uh, I've listened to that song probably 10,000 of your Spotify plays have to be me. Uh, and the video is remarkable. The video, what was that house? Can you talk about that house really quick? Yeah, so my mum's worked for the Kubrick family for like 30 years. So yeah, Stanley, Stanley Kubrick's house is uh, is where we filmed the music video, which is great. And we sort of used this billiard room and yeah, it was an incredible day and obviously wonderful to kind of be able to film in such a special place with obviously Stanley just being a complete legend. <laughs> well, the uh, the video is remarkable. This is a big day for you, by the way. Congrats on the new single, uh, Bend, with uh, Curtis Walsh, I believe. I listened to it this morning. Very ethereal, very haunting, very atmospheric. Uh, but it's a gorgeous, gorgeous song. Um, can you talk about that for a second? A big day. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's wonderful to, um, I was going to say, to have given birth to our song Baby, um, but that kind of is what it is like. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I haven't uh, met Curtis yet, but we, you know, wrote that song online and we recorded it remotely. He's in Ireland, I'm in London and um, yeah, and then we've released it. So we've, we've never met, but it's kind of, you know, been really thrilling and exciting to kind of create music in a way that, you know, we never have before. And um, yeah, to be able to share that with everyone now. So yeah, it's a very happy day. Release day is always like a real sense of relief and joy. Very cool. We'll drop that link in the comments. I got to remember to look at the camera. That's my one little cue. Um, <laughs> and you know, it's funny you say you haven't met, you haven't met Curtis. I've been in an active campaign uh, for going on seven months now. I've never met anybody there in person. I haven't even met Julian in person. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting used to this as well. Um, Anna, can, can you do one more for us and then uh, uh, just give us one more, uh, whichever your pick, I, I love them all, but uh, can you give us one more, is that all right? Absolutely. Promise will never grow up and the stars will align our way forth. I can't bear the thought you're facing it alone without me. Let us vow to God I use this treasure of this hope its own value. Fall aside told. How precious these moments truly are. Oh, for you've loved and you've lost too many a thing. But we'll keep him giving always. And up here, up no one can harm us and up here, up here Forever young, no promise will never Promise will never grow You see, there is no way we can lose our, 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 our. For you've loved and you've lost too many a thing, but we'll keep him giving always. And all. Yeah. 
Thank you. Anna, excellent. Thank you so much. I'll hopefully see you when lockdown eases around London. Thank you again. Thank you so much. All right, we have some more marketing hacks coming up for you. Uh, we have a special guided meditation session uh, to help you get centered and find that moment of Zen coming up for you uh, as we get to the end, wrapping up the show here uh, in just a few minutes. But uh, please keep the comments coming in. We are uh, open to uh, comments and uh, 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 whatever suggestions you have to make the show better. This is our first one. Uh, this is a risk. We are uh, pushing creative boundaries or we're trying to. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll look out for that commentary. And uh, if you have any questions, please join us. Uh, Julian, back to you. First of all, Jason, you uh, let me give you some applause here because you are a risk taker. You are bold. You are a marketing innovator. And I have to say this is going way better than I ever thought it would go. So congratulations to us. Second of all, Anna, incredible. Maybe just as incredible that her mom worked for Stanley Kubrick, which I don't even, like how that information comes out on the broadcast, my mind is blown. Nobody cares but me. But next up, we've got another marketing hack, folks. That's right, hold on to your hats because this is coming direct from Mr. Mark Master. Hello there, I'm Mark, and my one tip for you, my lovely, is around how we can personalize an automated world. And if you have a regular email that you send, it's what you send back to somebody that subscribes for the first time. Now, I know we're all okay now with sending automated emails to people when they subscribe, but how can we find a way that puts you in front of others so they think, this person's out of this world? And it's simply this, and I realize this because click-through rates went through the roof, is by sending a little video to a person that subscribed. And okay, what you say may be kind of generic, thanks for joining, but it's how you personalize it by calling them by their first name, not just at the beginning, but right at the very end as well. And then, oh, it's good. All right. I don't know if Jason, we've lost some audio, so I guess I'll just place through some little. Uh, uh, it was. Oh, there we are. We got a little funky. I'm, there. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, you're here. Okay, I couldn't you know hear you for was? a second. See, what was that? No, 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 no. I felt compelled. I felt compelled to to uh, to mute myself so we could have this conversation and say that I was on mute. I felt it was my duty. Uh, let me try that again. We'll get better <laughs> next time, folks. That was. That was Marky Masters, my good friend from Bournemouth. Uh, he is, you are the media, he's the founder. Check him out online, lots of, it's a great community for marketers. Uh, lots of great advice from Mark Masters. I think we got one more tip, this is a big one. One more marketing hack, over to you, Julian. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen, the final marketing hack of the show from the one, the only, Mr. John Esperion. 
Hi there, my name is John Aspirian. One of my best marketing tips for LinkedIn right now is to get people to follow not only you, but also your personal brand hashtag, because that means that LinkedIn is more likely to show your content to your followers if they follow you and also they follow your hashtag. Now, it took me two years to get up to 700 followers for my personal hashtag, but I've almost doubled that in just over a month simply by ending my LinkedIn posts by giving people a call to action for the LinkedIn hashtag. So I've got it up on screen. Follow hashtag LinkedIn Learner Lounge with 1,236 followers for more LinkedIn tips. Every so often I update the number of followers shown in brackets after the hashtag, but giving people a count and giving them a reason why they should follow a hashtag means they're more likely to do so. And that has really increased the number of followers I've got on my hashtag. And therefore, that increases my exposure in people's feeds on LinkedIn. Give it a try. I hope it works for you. John Asperian, folks. If you don't know John, he is brilliant. I met him uh, actually in, in Bournemouth at the U of the Media Conference hosted by Mark Masters. Uh, this guy, John, knows more about how LinkedIn, LinkedIn operates than LinkedIn does. I promise you. Follow him. Tremendous value. He calls himself a relentless relentlessly helpful technical copywriter. I like that, very specific. Uh, but uh, John, hey, I do wanna give a shout out to Big News at Active Campaign. Uh, we did announce, we have a brand new community launch coming today. Uh, we're taking all of our community channels, rolling them into one, gamifying it, uh, leaderboards, all sorts of fun, but uh, in one unified place. Congrats to the community team, uh, Molly and Gabby. Well done, uh, big day, and uh, so excited for the new community launch. Over to you, Julian. <laughs> All right. Well, now, Jason, we've come to the point of the show that uh, I particularly find very useful. Uh, I don't know about everybody else, but I'm a little bit stressed out. Uh, you know, I haven't seen another human being besides my family for quite some time. Uh, that's really just because my family doesn't trust me around people, let alone uh, what's happening in the world. But we have a guided meditation for you right now. So this should be nice and relaxing, a beautiful way to end the show. A little bit of a ADSR or whatever they call it. Hello, hello everyone. My name is Dana Balicki. I'm a transformational coach, teacher, and guide, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. Thank you so much to Active Campaign for bringing us together for a moment of center. So I know that you must be pumped to go out in the world and share everything that you've just been learning and that you've been working on and the lovely Jonah Berger, what I love about his work is that he talks about not just pushing harder. And so what I want to bring to us here together today is, is, is that, right? It's to not just like push harder, right? But to come from a place of centeredness because we're all, we all went through last year together in our own different ways and we're affected in different ways. And perhaps there's, you know, some anxieties around, uh, you know, not being able to be together in the same ways or working from home remotely and all the challenges that come up through that. And what I really want to offer here is that no matter what's going on in your life and no matter what you're doing in your work out in the world, that you can always start from a place of center. Right? And when we do that, when we remember to come back here, we have so much more value and uh, power to offer and to share with others, right? When we're coming from here, as opposed to just like being caught up in the frenzy, right? So let's do a quick practice together. I believe in, in, in quality, not quantity. So put your feet flat on the floor. Right, we're going to do a little grounding, a little centering, a little coming back here to our bodies, to the planet, and ultimately to each other. Okay? Feet flat on the floor, eyes closed. Breathing in through the nose, nice and slow and deep. As long as that's comfortable for you, you can breathe in and out through your mouth if that's better for you. Inhaling deep into the belly. If you want to put a hand on the heart or a hand on the belly or let your hands just rest gently in your lap, all of those are fine. And exhaling out through the nose, bringing the navel back towards the spine. Let's do that a few times together. 
slowing down the body, slowing down the mind. Not just pushing, 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 but allowing. Good. And bring your attention to the circumference of your abdomen and you can visualize it like a beautiful tree trunk with thick bark. And on your next exhale, you're going to stretch and extend that bark all the way down through your seat, down through the layers of building, down into the planet, all the way down to the center of the earth. And let's visualize the core of Mother Earth like a big glowing golden ball of light. And you're going to visualize your grounding trunk wrapping around the core of the planet three times and pulling snugly. Still breathing. Good. And just feeling into that connection, knowing that there are thousands of us connected in just this way together right now. Willing to slow down, willing to be in our bodies, willing to just be with reality as it is, to be connected to the planet and to know this connection is always here for us. And that we're all in this together. And let's just leave this connection right here, down to the center of the earth. You can twinkle your fingers and toes, just wiggle them around, maybe move your head around on your neck. Just a little bit, nothing too strenuous. Again, nice and slow and sweet. You can gently open your eyes, right? Maybe you want to move your shoulders around, a little stretch, right? Before you get back into the hustle bustle of the day. Hey, we're all here in this together. Hey, you can always come back to this centered, grounded practice really simply. Anytime you're feeling like just scattered out in the universe and your energy feels frayed or whatever's happening in your home around you, in your family, in your community, just do yourself a favor. Do us all a favor right? and take a moment. You can always close your eyes, feel your feet on the floor, wherever you are on the planet and send your energy just back down to the center of the planet, wrap around, connect, okay? All right, such a pleasure to be here with you today. I hope to see you soon. Good luck in all you're doing. Remember, you can slow down and center, just speed up, okay? Okay, see you soon and best wishes. Thank you, Dana. I feel, uh, I feel like, man, I needed that. It's been a rough week. Uh, I've been uh, sort of exploring the Headspace app and trying to find my center. Uh, Julian, you know what I like to do, Julian, is uh, go back to uh, my roots when I worked in college at a record store and put on some uh, Enya. Uh, I really like to start with Orinoco Flow before I get into the more progressive Shepherd's Moon. Uh, but, you know, I do celebrate her entire catalog. Um, Hope you enjoyed that, folks. Uh, feedback is welcome. We will take it. We'll shorten this up. We were supposed to be, we're running a little bit late, but that's the end of the show. Julian, you got anything to uh, to say to these folks before we leave them? Nothing uh, other than that I am highly impressed by not only your history of being the uh, front man for the defunct metal band Silent Cry, but also your knowledge of the Enya catalog. Not everybody can pull off those two extremes, but you, Jason Miller, you've done it, and you're you're a, uh, an incredible B2B marketer and live streamer now. So congratulations, Jason. Congratulations. Hey, hey, hey. We're, we're, we're all trying here, uh, Julian. Um, I know you're uh, – congrats on the, the, the Patreon launch. Uh, my wife and I always watch your concerts live when you do them. Uh, where can people find you before we sign off here for the show? You can find me at patreon.com slash Julian Villard and uh, – at Julian Villard on all the platforms. I'm also Twitch streaming now. So, you know, I consider myself a bit of a, a B2B marketer myself, which means that basically all my friends are tired of my endless posting. So you too can follow me and, and, and experience my, uh, my stuff if you want, please, by all means, I'm out there. 
Fantastic. Uh, and thank you all. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. Or if you're here in the UK, uh, your happy hour. Uh, I'm going to clock out and go grab a drink. Uh, let's roll those credits and uh, let's, see, let's who, see who we have to thank for pulling this show together. Thank you. A big thank you to everyone at Active Campaign, uh, Julian, Joel, the production team, uh, Ernie. Uh, the list goes on and on. There's too many people to name, but I see we're going to have... Here we go. We're going to do it. Right now. I mean, if this is a real late night show or if it's like SNL, we would have a credit roll. You know, that's how they do it. And I, I think this went great. I mean, I'm, I'm biased. Yeah. I, you, you know, it's good? a gig for me. But I think I think it. And then you know what? You should give yourself a big, big round of applause, Jason. You've, you've done amazing. In my we'll see. We'll see if uh, this is the first show or the last show or both, I guess. Oh, wait. But, so that's uh, it? That's I the end of the game? Okay. Well, it was, it's, been, it's been wonderful. And I had a blast. And the memories will be incredible. Thank you so much. Hey, we'll see you on April 22nd. March 25th is our next lunch break. April 22nd is the next big show. Uh, we are releasing keynotes in the next day or two. You don't want to miss this. I gave you a little bit of a hint earlier. Thank you so, thank you so much, folks. Cheers.